This video will provide an overview of graph embedding learning. This is where we learn vector representations of nodes in a graph based on the connectivity of the graph and maybe having different kinds of relations in the graphs as well. So for example, in Wikipedia knowledge graphs, we have different kinds of relations that connect the source and destination nodes. So we have all sorts of different kinds of graph structure to learn these vector representations from. This is different from, say, GPT-3 or Siamese BERT and the way that they learn uh, represent vector representations of text data or entity types compared to using the graph structure in order to compute these vector representations based on, say, having uh, distance metrics between the theta representations of source and destination nodes that share an edge in the graph. So this video will be an overview of concepts in graph embedding learning, going beyond uh, just knowledge graphs and looking at all the kind of data sets that are out there. Papers with code is now organizing papers with data. And so we'll look through the different graph uh, data sets that are contained in papers with data to get a better sense of what's out there with graph embedding learning. Uh, we'll also dive into the concept of contrastive learning and how that's uh, the primary way of learning these graph representations and these embeddings for the nodes in the graph. And then we'll get into the PyTorch big graph and some of the contributions that make uh, large scale graph embedding learning uh, even easier and more practical. So we'll start off with a quick overview of what graphs are and how they're represented as uh, discrete data structures. So we have things like say this graph right here as represented as an adjacency matrix where we have ones to signal the edges and zeros to signal that there is not an edge. So for example, there's a zero in the place of one to seven, meaning that the node one is not connected to the node seven. So these edges can represent all sorts of things in different kinds of graph data sets that are out there. And we're going to look through papers with data to see exactly 118 different examples of these graph data sets that can easily be uh, used for deep learning and plugged into these frameworks like the PyTorch Big Graph uh, embedding learning algorithm or maybe graph convolutional networks, all these exciting ideas around graph representation learning. But so some examples could be uh, recommendation systems in e-commerce. This could be a user to item graph where you have uh, the users are connected to items of the graph. Or it probably wouldn't look like this structure would be more of a bipartite kind of structure. But you could have a link prediction in social media. This could be a Twitter graph where the edges represent a follow relationship. So uh, users seven and five follow six on the social network. And in this case, you don't have directed edges, you have undirected edges. So say it's, it's uh, like a friendship or a LinkedIn connection where it's reciprocal. And uh, if five follows six and six follows five as well. And then you have uh, drug interactions and these protein-protein uh, interaction networks. We'll look at this kind of uh, drug repurposing graph and how this looks where you say, uh, you know, it inhibits this kind of uh, bi uh, biological activity and this kind of thing. I'm not an expert on this, but these are these kind of graph structures that you see as you look at these things like these uh, biological networks and these different ideas. And this is a really great uh, survey paper that goes through all these different kinds of drug-drug protein target interaction networks that are extremely large scale. And so using things like PyTorch Big Graph helps you maybe learn better representations of things like say this, um, uh, this different uh, drug, where is the drug? Different drugs in the graph, or this is an example of a drug in the graph. And you, as you have these very large scale sets of interactions, you can use the graph structure to maybe learn a better representation than say just using GPT-3 to auto regressively model the text context of uh, clinical trial reports or things like that. So then we also have knowledge graphs, a really well-known one where we have different kinds of relations between, say, uh, states, uh, people, all sorts of things. And then, say, we have road networks as well. Just some examples of different kinds of graph data sets and graph structure data that is out there. So staying on this topic of previewing the different graph data sets that are out there and also previewing at the big contribution of PyTorch Big Graph, the Facebook graph of user nodes and interactions like uh, say likes on a post or friendships and things like that, the scale of this graph is 2 billion user nodes and 10 trillion edges. So it's a massive graph for doing these things. Uh, things like the Pinterest user to item graph is an example of the bipartite kind of uh, recommendation system graph. 2 billion users and 17 billion edges of relations between users and items. So extremely large scale graph. And then obviously these biological network graphs, these can get really massive as well. So we have this problem of trying to embed these really massive graphs into vector representation. So this is the Freebase full data set extracted from Wikipedia. So going through Wikipedia and say, uh, looking at things like the state Arizona uh, is a part of the United States, is a part of North America, or different relation types like that kind of thing as you traverse through Wikipedia and extract all the kinds of relations you can, 120 million nodes, 25,000 relation types, and 2.7 billion of these edges that signal uh, these relations between the different nodes. So 
just if you're forming vectors in a word to vector kind of sense where each of these nodes has a vector representation, say you have 100 dimensions for each of the vectors and 120 million nodes, you're already at about 50 gigabytes of vector data for the entire uh, node set in this Wikipedia full graph. So this is the big contribution of PyTorch Big Graph is trying to figure out how to efficiently optimize these vectors, even though you can't really load the entire vector set into memory. So you're gonna have to ha do things like block partitioning, these different kinds of ideas for learning these vector representations of 120 million nodes in the uh, Wikidata Freebase uh, full knowledge graph. If you've been watching Henry AI Labs videos lately, you know I've been working with the Weaviate vector search engine, and particularly I've been campaigning for these open access web demo front ends where you can play around with vector search engines. So I'm really excited to announce the upcoming release of the Wikidata knowledge graph in Weaviate. Uh, this isn't completely out there yet. It's something that's on the near term uh, horizon. But what it is is you have the, uh, the 80 million of the 120 million nodes that are shown here. You have 80 million of these nodes and you have the vector representations that are learned by doing graph embeddings with these Wikipedia relations. So it's a really exciting web demo that you'll be able to do these kind of GraphQL queries and see what kind of nearest neighbor searches are available by using these uh, graph embeddings compared to say uh, text embeddings from the Wikipedia graph and using things like the Siamese BERT architecture or GPT-3, you'll be able to have this web de demo where it's one click to get into this interface and then you can see the difference between say how this uh, understands relations between named entities like uh, different brands or uh, say different sports teams, celebrities, these kind of specific things that having this knowledge graph structure would uh, perform better than say just having a text representation without any kind of graph context. So this is a reason that I'm really interested in graph embeddings and really excited to see these uh, web demos for these vector search engines coming to life. The Wikidata Freebase dataset is one example of a really interesting graph dataset that we can use to learn node embeddings and then visualize these node embeddings. Papers with Code and Papers with Data has been organizing these different graph datasets. So here's an example of all sorts of different datasets that contain this graph structure. You have citation graphs where you have, say, scientific publications and links in the graph to note uh, citation relationships. So say uh, the MoCo paper cites SimCLR or, or, or AlexNet or this kind of relationship between these graphs. So you have all sorts of these different kinds of graphs. PubMed dataset where you have, uh, I think these are mostly like biochemistry papers and things like that or medical reports. I'm not exactly sure, but the PubMed data set or having this scientific literature mining application. You have collections like the Open Graph Benchmark. I imagine this has things like molecule graphs or probably more uh, recommendation graphs and things like that. But here's a resource if you want to look into all sorts of different kinds of graph data sets that are available and that are uh, used in academic literature to benchmark these graph representation learning algorithms. So my dream would be to have, say, a Weaviate endpoint where you could uh, click on any of these data sets and then do vector search and see the difference between graph embeddings versus solely text embeddings or solely image embeddings or whatever kind of graph modality or data modality and then multimodal data eventually in the future as well. But having this uh, click link where you can visualize the vector representations that deep learning, deep neural networks produce and how you can do semantic search using this new kind of neural representation for all this different kind of data that's out there and all these different kinds of algorithms as we'll get back into the PyTorch big graph and explain these uh, advances and how you really learn representations of uh, nodes based on graph data structures. So finally, before diving into the algorithms of contrastive learning for graph embedding learning, another really interesting idea is to convert tabular data into graph structured data by using the, uh, the categories of the columns or the features as graph relations. So this paper, Modeling Relational Data with Graph Convolutional Networks, has been an extremely popular paper. It has nearly 2,000 citations and something like four years published in around 2017, with this really exciting idea of turning tabular data into graph structure and then using graph embedding learning algorithms, whether it's the graph convolutional network. And at the end of this video, uh, I'll talk about why the GCN is a bit different from, say, the, um, the style of big graph and things like complex and these kind of uh, embedding learning algorithms, but it's another strategy of how we can use uh, graph, the inductive biases of uh, graph structure to learn better representation. In general, across different data domains, contrastive learning is the workhorse of learning vector embeddings. SimCLR is a really famous example of this for learning vector embeddings of images. We start off with an original image like this dog image, then we sample two data augmentations to form two semantically similar pairs, and then we try to maximize the alignment of the two vector representations that are produced for each of these two views of the image, and the idea being that dog images are then going to be more similar, more semantically similar in the vector space to other dogs and say uh, trucks or airplanes, things like that by optimizing this vector embedding space 
through the use of these contrastive learning frameworks where you push together these representations, make them uh, close to each other, and then you push apart representations from other uh, negatively sampled images from the batch, like say cats uh, or airplanes and trucks and that kind of idea. So transitioning this into graph embeddings, now what we want to do is we want to learn, we want to align the similarity between a source and a destination node. So similar to in data augmentation and images, where this would be our source and this would be our destination, and we consider these two to be uh, semantically similar, we're going to use the relations on the graph to form our positive pairs. So we have these kinds of functions, which, which is how we're aligning the embeddings. So rather than having a neural network that uh, takes the uh, input and then does this forward pass to get the vector representation, we're going to go right to the vector representation with this theta sub s as the vector representation of the source node, the vector representation of the destination node, and we also have some embedding for the relation type. As we have, say, knowledge graphs, we can have many different kinds of relations, and we use that kind of relation embedding in our similarity function. So a lot of these uh, graph embedding papers like uh, transi, complex, they're different uh, graph operators is what they call these. And this is the uh, G sub S of the alignment between or G sub D. The, this is the function that uh, produces the F of E of, um, of two of these different uh, vector embeddings, the, uh, the, node, the source node as well as the individual type for this relation if you have a multi-relation graph. So then the way that you optimize these uh, relations is by having a margin loss. So uh, differently from SimClear where you use say the info NCE loss and you just have uh, like a dot product on the, on the top term and then on the bottom you have a large dot product with a lot of negatives, you use this margin to try to uh, get this structure, this loss between a uh, source to destination relation that is in the graph compared to a negative sample that is not in the graph. And this is describing how you sample these uh, relations based on uh, not being in the graph. So negative sampling is usually done by uh, just perturbing either the source or the destination given the different kind of relation type. So for example, in knowledge graphs, you could have uh, is located in, was born in relations that are kind of similar or things like say uh, uh, produces, if it's like a company that produces some product, these different kind of relations and these multi-relation graphs and relations are how you're going to be uh, sampling negative edges so they share the same kind of relations for the sake of having some kind of uh, uh, positive signal in sampling the negatives for this kind of optimization technique. So as previously with the 50 gigabytes it would require to store 120 million different uh, 100 dimensional vector embeddings for uh, the 120 million nodes in say a uh, knowledge graph or whatever kind of graph it is, the challenge in this is building vector representations for large graphs and having some kind of memory optimization scheme in order to do this. So say you have 2 billion nodes and you have 100 dimensional vectors for each node that require about 800 gigabytes of memory just for the embeddings. So as you're doing the uh, embeddings, you need some kind of strategy for swapping out these vectors onto the uh, RAM of the computer and things like this, and also you want to you know be mindful of the speed of doing this. So the contribution of PyTorch Big Graph is to scale the graphs with billions of nodes and trillions of edges, and they do this through these three different optimizations with this other thing about uh, different kinds of relations if you have a multi-relation kind of graph like a knowledge graph. So the first thing is a block decomposition of the adjacency matrix, how you have these different buckets so that you can uh, partition up the, uh, the edges that you're sampling and rotate them in and out so that you don't uh, harm the negative sampling by having this uh, partitioning of the original massive adjacency matrix as obviously as we mentioned previously we don't want to have all these uh, all this all these vectors loaded into the memory at once so we partition it up into these different uh, buckets and then we have a distributed execution model which is the way that we're doing the uh, parameter server and these kind of architectures for distributed computing and then we have an efficient negative sampling where we uh, are going to share negatives within our batch rather than uh, randomly sampling negatives for each individual source to destination uh, relation. The block partitioning is a strategy that allows PyTorch Big Graph to train these massive graph embeddings without loading all of the embeddings into memory at once. So the idea is to divide up the source and destination uh, nodes into chunks so that all you need is this chunk or this block or this bucket in order to update the source and destination vector embeddings by using the contrastive learning objective. So we have these different uh, partitions of the graph based on the activation of the edges. And in some cases, we might have a very sparse relation between a source and a destination. So the, uh, the chunk looks like this compared to a uh, matrix like this. So this bucket order, something they note in the paper is that you wanna have uh, a transfer between the buckets. So it's like P1, P2, P2, P3, with respect to the P sub uh, I, J, and so on, denoting how you're partitioning the overall slice of uh, source X destination with the, um, with the node. So hopefully that makes some sense. But the idea being that uh, you want to at least have started learning the embeddings for uh, one of the nodes before you start uh, transferring and swapping out the buckets between other nodes. And that's kind of their inside out bucket order, but not exactly sure about that part. But 
Overall, the idea is to chunk up the source and destination nodes so that you're not loading the entire thing in memory at once. And they have this distributed execution system where they have this uh, parameter lock server. Again, I'm not exactly sure what's going on here, but the idea is that uh, you're not loading the entire parameters into memory at once. And then you also, they describe some problems with having just a standard uh, shared parameter server where say you have asynchronous updates to the uh, parameter, like as you usually have a distributed SGD training system, you each of the machines will do their grading update and then just asynchronously write the updates. But they have some kind of locking mechanism in Big Graph that avoids this kind of uh, shared parameter server kind of architecture. And maybe someone, if they have a better sense of this, could uh, leave a comment on the video that explains uh, this particular architecture. But so then at the end, they have the batch negative sampling where they're going to be sharing negatives within the whole batch rather than doing the uh, perturbed sources and perturbed destinations for each of the different uh, source relation destination edges in the sampled batch for the positive alignment and the negative alignment where you're doing that. Um, that uh, negative margin kind of thing. So in the PyTorch Big Graph paper, these are some of the data sets that they use to benchmark the algorithms. So they have live journal, a user user interaction graph on a blogging network, Twitter, a user user follow graph, YouTube, a user user interaction graph, or it's uh, where you're classifying the user based on the category. So say you've uh, subscribed to Henry AI Labs, they might classify that as uh, a technology channel probably. So it's that kind of interaction graph with these social networks. And then also we have the free based knowledge graph, which is the Wikidata graph that's gonna be available in Weaviate if you wanna play around with these uh, graph embedding vector search engine things. So some of the tasks they're gonna be benchmarking these systems on are link prediction in the graph. So what you do is you have the train test split where you have 75% of the data used for training, 25% user testing, and you're gonna predict a missing link that was in that test set. So say it's a Twitter graph, you're gonna ha there's gonna be some ground truth annotation between a user and another user, whether they follow each other or whether, I guess it's a directed graph, so one user follows the other and it might not necessarily be returned, but you're gonna be predicting the, the presence of that follow in the graph in the test set, and that's how you have these train test splits for uh, graph data and things like link prediction. And then you also might use the graph embedding vector, so again, going back to the uh, WeV8 Wikidata embeddings, you might use the, the embedding as the uh, feature set to do some kind of other machine learning task or just have a linear classifier just on top of that representation. So to just come back to the scale of these graphs, on LiveJournal you have 5 million users and 70 million edges denoting user-user interactions. In YouTube you have 1 million nodes and 3 million edges between users and then the categories of their subscriptions on YouTube like say technology channels. Uh, Twitter you have the user-user follow graph, 40 million nodes and 1.5 billion edges. You have a smaller scale freebase 15k data set, this one only has 15k nodes, 1.5k relation types, and then 600,000 edges between the entities according to these different relation types. So this is kind of like a smaller scale knowledge graph for uh, like research and these kind of things. And then you have the Freebase full data set where you have 120 million nodes and again 100 dimensional vectors, 48.5 gigabytes, and this is going to be available on the WeVA web demo. An interesting detail about this is the difference between these style of graph embeddings compared to the graph convolutional networks. In the graph convolutional network, you see the representation with some kind of feature matrix. So say you're doing a, a Wikidata text embedding graph. What you do on the first layer of the network where you have this hidden layer H sub L, so say you know the second layer of the graph convolutional network is you do these uh, sequential passes of a deep neural network as we know are these architectures, you would initialize it with the representations from say Siamese BERT or GPT-3. So you start off with some kind of featureization of the data and then you propagate the adjacency matrix and use the graph structure with this uh, graph convolutional kernel in order to do some kind of output prediction task. So that's kind of the difference between graph convolutional networks where you're uh, using this local propagation and you have this gradient descent, this kind of strategy compared to this uh, graph embedding technique where you have these, uh, where you go right to the vectors of each of the embeddings and then you use these graph operator functions in order to uh, compute the final F of E, which is the E being the edge and then uh, this uh, source relation destination is the components that go as the input to this F of E as you compare it with the negative sample. So comparing this difference to say something like the graph convolutional network and looking at overall the frameworks of doing these things. So. Uh, this graph embedding technique, it might be a little more efficient, more uh, easier to implement, for, certainly on large scale graphs compared to something like the graph convolutional network. So to transition into just throwing some ideas out there, it does look like graphs are one of the most interesting interfaces for injecting prior knowledge or inductive bias into deep learning systems. Now obviously we have data that is graph structured by nature, things like these molecules or these user user social media interaction graphs, but also adding this kind of graph structure to our text data. So it might be tempting to just 
uh, use GPT-3 or Siamese BERT to just model text as some kind of continuous data stream like images or uh, audio. But instead, we can kind of use this discrete graph structure and use this uh, relational modeling between nodes to have more inductive bias about text data. So I recently wrote a survey paper on text data augmentation for deep learning, where we're trying to overcome, mostly we're trying to overcome this problem of not overfitting with these deep neural networks and not having to annotate massive data sets in order to have quality natural language processing models. So using these knowledge graphs may be a huge step in uh, having label preserving transformations for text data, which is the key uh, driver of progress in image data augmentation, is that all those things like rotation, horizontal flipping, brightness, they're all label preserving. Whereas with text data and natural language processing, it's harder to sample label preserving transformations that would allow you to just take data augmentation to the scale and success it's seen in computer vision. So knowledge graphs could be a key interface for making this work. One of my favorite applications in deep learning and in technology in general is scientific literature mining. And I it personally is trying to keep up with the deep learning literature and making videos like this and trying to have a research career. I'm definitely very aware with the challenge of keeping up with the academic literature as it grows so fast and you need some kind of automated tool and advances in these tools to be able to keep up with the latest advances. So there are a lot of really interesting ways of using graphs with these scientific literature mining applications. So we, I think the Quora Citation Network, I think it might be called Citeseer as well. I think this is the most common example of this, this citation graph. I think uh, Semantic Scholar and uh, that research group, they, they produce a lot of these uh, graphs as well, where you have, say, affiliation graphs, where the edge uh, says, like, we're both from uh, Harvard University or whatever it is. But these kind of citation graphs may be able to provide a lot of information for these scientific literature mining systems. And you can imagine interesting traversals in this graph as well as you traverse through categories. So say this paper, the main category you'd classify it as robustness, but then it cites a paper that you classify as data augmentation that you classify as say neural architecture search or say knowledge distillation as you traverse through these categories of different uh, niches of research. And Obviously, this is intu intuitive for people watching this video with deep learning topics, but you can imagine generalizing this to, say, uh, chemistry research and all these different kinds of ideas as you have this structure of the kind of uh, meta topics within the, you know, within the broader category of some research. And then I also think it's really interesting, this knowledge graph extraction. So uh, Papers with Code has been doing this result mining where they go, where they use natural language processing to go into these papers and say they go, uh, we just hit a new state of the art, 98% image net. Papers with Code will classify that and then update the uh, website with the leaderboards by using that kind of automated uh, knowledge mining kind of thing. So you can imagine having these kind of relations where you train these supervised learning tasks to build up these knowledge graphs. They have this interpretability where, where at a smaller scale, you can manually look and make sure these relations are uh, working properly. And then you have this kind of graph structure to do something like a PyTorch big graph and see the difference between graph embedding learning compared to just a raw autoregressive GPT modeling or maybe some kind of contrastive Siamese BERT modeling. And then finally, one category, which isn't quite scientific literature mining, very specific to deep learning, is computational graphs for neural architecture search. In this data set, Deep Nets 1 million, we'll look at it next, is a very interesting example of this as kind of an out-of-the-box thinking of how we might be able to use graph embeddings to help with something like neural architecture search. So here's a really interesting development in deep learning that I'm not even completely sure how to make sense of this yet, but here's another thing that we can maybe use graph neural networks for. So we've seen things like uh, amoeba net where we use evolutionary algorithms in order to have this uh, genotype of neural architectures and then you render these architectures you train them you see the performance and so on and it's a very large scale search of kind of trying to like brute force what the best neural network architecture would be so we have these general building blocks like convolutional layers uh, multi-layer perceptrons attention layers different kinds of normalization schemes or say you know recurrent neural networks depending on like the inductive bias of the problem but basically the search space for trying to optimize some perfect neural architecture is massive and they use things like reinforcement learning evolution bayesian optimization they even have differentiable architecture search uh, the paper titled darts where they try to optimize these uh, architectures so these architectures are graph structured things and you might be able to use these kind of data sets to maybe uh, learn graph embeddings where you would say do a vector similarity search where you say uh, here's a particular kind of structure within this big gigantic computational graph that performed well maybe we can see where else the structure appears and have this kind of uh, vector representation of similarity search for finding similar structures and other kinds of architectures as we do things like 1 million training architectures this is a pretty funny idea overall I just think this is a really interesting data set and uh, you know I'm really not sure yet what will be done with this but maybe graph embeddings is one direction of something you could do with this. Thank you so much for watching this overview of graph embeddings and the different kinds of techniques that are being used, like using the contrastive learning between source and destination nodes 
based on different kind of relations and negatively sampling alternative nodes, source nodes or destination nodes for doing the negative comparison with things like a uh, margin based loss. This video also explains some of the different data sets that are being used. I really hope you check out papers with data and filter it based on graph and hopefully you find something inspirational to work with graph embeddings. And then overall, I know it was just a really quick description of the PyTorch big graph, but I hope the general motivation was clear that if you're gonna to try to have these vector embeddings for each of the nodes in the graph, as you have these massive graphs like Wikidata or uh, say these user-user interaction graphs in social media networks, or you know what happens with biological networks, you can't really store all the vectors in one machine. So you need to have this, these things like block partitioning and different kinds of distributed execution models in order to, or this batch negative sampling as well, in order to efficiently uh, learn these node representations for large scale graphs. So hopefully that general motivation was clear, even if it wasn't the best description of exactly how the block partitioning scheme is uh, coming together. So anyway, so thanks for watching this video. Please subscribe to Henry AI Labs for more deep learning and AI videos. And please stay tuned for the Weaviate uh, web demo of Wikidata coming soon. Oh.